Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 108. Thanks so much for joining me. Today's guest is Brendan Constantine. He'll be here with us in about 15 minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too. So make sure you click the like button and share and subscribe if you're not yet. Uh, make sure that you just click on something, because if you click on something, it really helps poetry spread around the internet. Now, um, hang on a second. There we go. So, um, yeah, sorry for the bit of a delayed start. We YouTube has been very buggy lately, but um, it looks like it's working, so we're good to go. Um, now, before we begin, as we usually do, we are going to start with um, Poet Respond poems. And um, we have two poets here. Um, we have a Tuesday poem and today's poem. Um, today's poem was Letter from Delhi to Kabul by Kandala Singh. What we're going to do first is call up Kandala. Um, so give me a moment to get that, uh, get Kandala on the line. Hey, Candela, thanks so much for joining me. Just give me one second to pull you in, and then um, and we will have you. Right. So, so, hello. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so glad you could share this poem and join us. It, it's like 5.30 in the morning there, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, did, you, did you wake up early? Did you stay up late? Uh, I woke up early. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you could be here. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what this poem, um, how this poem came to be and why you wrote it? Um, yeah, it is, of course, like all of us over the world, I was struggling to articulate, process this horrible thing that's Afghanistan. And added to that was the worry for some people I care about. Um, and uh, the earrings, the junkas, which is a traditional kind of earring found in Pakistan, it's a bell-shaped earring found in Pakistan, like lot, lots of countries in South Asia. I found myself frantically searching for these earrings that morning uh, when I was struggling to make sense of what happened. Uh, like a mad woman almost, I was turning the house upside down and I was like, I've got to find these earrings. And then I stopped and I was like, this country is falling apart and, and you're looking for earrings like and i think uh so i think it just really started from there trying to understand what that meant and uh, just sort of use that as a way to just uh, express i guess my concern uh for the women of afghanistan yeah it's such a moving poem because it's so um so sim simple and and sort of rooted in the the emotion that's tied to those um earrings and and it and it I don't know. There's a really elegant way that it moves through the poem. Um, did you have? Did you know where you were going with it as you wrote it? Um, was that something that you sort of planned out and, and knew what you were going to do, or did you just sit down and at the blank page and let let your feelings come out? Uh, I sat down with the blank page, but I let a prompt guide me. Um, I'm uh, I'm I'm a member of a community called Centered, run by the Canadian writer Sarah Seliki. Uh, so I have daily prompts, and the prompt I had that day was things that feel light, uh, which now when I look back at, at it, it shaped the poem because it's all about the lightness and the heaviness of the earrings and the situation and so on. Um, and yeah, it was, it was I think, uh, good that I had that that day because I think with something that this overwhelming, you need to start with something small, right, to mm -hmm. just grasp. Do it so, but yeah. Other than that, I didn't prom. I didn't plan it out. It just this is what emerged on the page. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm so glad you wrote this and and could share it. Do you want to go ahead and read it? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Letter from Delhi to Kabul. My sister, I have spent all day looking for those jhumkas, heavy with silver. I know you like them light but heavy is traditional, and I wanted you to have the best you had said, pressing the pendulums into my palms. All morning I search for the light you gave me, the sparkle of glass beads, red, pink, blue, green. 
I love Delhi. There I can go to the mall alone and it's so safe. Safe? I remember thinking such a relative term. Us giggling over popcorn at a movie in Kathmandu. Exchanging notes on the pressures to marry, make babies, tap dancing through a sunlit mall in Delhi. And now tanks take over your city, angry fistfuls of men erupting from the earth. My sister, how do I hold you in prayer? Your laughing eyes, the way your scarf slips when your hair catches the light. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that poem. It's just beautiful. I love that ending. And that, that angry fistfuls of men erupting from the earth is such an image, too. I and mean, that's one of the ones that's going to stick with me. Uh, thanks for sharing this poem. Thank you. In solidarity with the Afghan sisters. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I'm glad you could uh, wake up early to join us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, have a good day. You too. Yeah, so once again, that was um, uh, Kandala Singh with Letter from Delhi to Kabul. And just moments before the show, um, I got the audio for the other poem, for the Tuesday poem that we're going to be sharing. So I, tr I was trying to scramble to get this, uh, get this ready so you could play it, too. This is from Michael Mayerhofer, who um, is his second a time, I think it's his third time total in Poets Respond. But he had a different uh, article. Uh, let me see if we can get this set up. And hopefully the audio will work okay, because I haven't even listened to it yet. Um, but there was an article, um, and I'm not even going to show you the video, actually. I could. Um, but it's pretty disturbing. Um, and this this video, um, it, it's not related to the news. I mean, it's news that this video is circulating, but a giant tortoise filmed attacking and eating baby bird. And this was one of those viral videos that was going around this week. And, um, you know, it, it's just amazing to watch and sort of horrifying at the same time. And um, you know, because you think that the the tortoise, you know, such a peaceful creature, right? And then all of a sudden it attacks and eats this bird that was just sitting right next to it. And... Um, so we always like to find poems uh, for the series that are different, you know, that are not the main news story that everybody's talking about. It's always good to, to find and explore different angles and, and smaller pieces of news and current events. And this one moving around, um, I'll read what Michael said to you about it. He said, um, this is Michael Mayerhofer. This ended up not making it into the poem, but when I read about this, and um, it's this, maybe I'll show, maybe I will show um, just the preview. This is an article from The Guardian. And I won't show the actual picture or the actual video, but um, this was the um, this was the uh, article that was about um, horrifying and amazing is the title under the headline. And this tortoise here just just eats that bird out of nowhere, in a kind of shocking display of nature. And um, it's sort of it's, it's weird how these things sort of resonate at certain times. And maybe that's what Michael was tapping into. But anyway, I'll continue reading his note. Um, this ended up not making it into the poem, but when I read about this, I immediately flashed back to another story from nearly 20 years ago about Kamenyak. Blessed one is the, the, what that means. A Kenyan lioness praised in newspapers for adopting and safeguarding baby antelope. Specifically, I remember the consternation the article's author felt when one particular baby antelope died, presumably of natural causes, and the lioness, who had previously been protecting it, immediately changed gears and ate it. Hunger is hunger, after all. If horror and beauty are the two seemingly opposite threads from which nature is woven, those threads crisscross constantly. Maybe that's true of society, too. So this was his reaction to, um, to this, this viral video that was going around from that Guardian article. And um, let me see if I can get the audio to work. Giant tortoise filmed attacking and eating baby bird. I still remember reading how sailors used to flip giant tortoises onto their shells and stack them like living TV dinners in their dank ship bellies for weeks, months, butchered as needed. We ask so much of stomachs. We want our knives to stay sharp but conscionable in their cutting, noble somehow as they slice clean through all that red undersilk. In one story, Christ transforms the sea into a graveyard just to feed people who forgot to pack a sack lunch. A turned chick takes a tumble, meets a solar eclipse with teeth. Sometimes it hurts to be here. And that was uh, once again Michael Mayerhofer with his poem Giant Tortoise Filmed Attacking and Eating Baby Bird. 
And um, I just love that ending too. That the the, um, the 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 image of a solar eclipse with teeth, and then sometimes it hurts to be here. Yeah, for sure it does. It's you know life comes with a lot of hurt. And um, really interesting poem, interesting place to go with that. So it was Michael Mayerhofer, um, a bonus poem that we're going to be publishing on Tuesday. That's going to be August 31st. That's the poem that we'll be doing then for Poets Respond on Rattle.com. Um, now, we, uh, let's move to um, our main guest. I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to put up the splash screen here and call up um, Brendan Constantine, who's just one of my favorite poets. Oops, that's next week's guest. There's Brendan Constantine, uh, one of my favorite poets. Um, wonderful, wonderful teacher as well. And um, we'll be talking to him in just a moment. So let me get connected. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Um, Brendan Constantine is on the line here. Um, Brendan was born in Los Angeles, the second child of actors Michael Constantine and Juliana McCarthy, an ardent supporter of Southern California's poetry communities and one of its most recognized poets. He has served as teacher of poetry in the local schools and colleges since 1995. His first collection, Letters to Guns, was released in February 2009 from Red Hen Press, um, it was followed up by Birthday Girl with Possum um, under the performance-based publisher Wright Bloody, which established him as both a uh, page poet and stage poet. His work's been featured all over the place in uh, poetry, Tin House, Best American Poetry, Poem a Day, all sorts of places. Um, his most recent collection is Dimension My Darling from 2016 from Red Hen Press and Bouncy Bounce, a chapbook from Blue Horse Press. He currently teaches creative writing at the Windward School. In addition, he brings poetry workshops to veterans, hospitals, foster care centers, and shelters for the homeless. He is also very proud of his work with the Alzheimer's Project. Since 2017, he has been working with speech pathologist Michael Beale to develop the first poetry workshop for people dealing with aphasia. Um, he also appeared in four issues of Rattle and was interviewed in the uh, Los Angeles Poets issue number 52. And uh, here he is, Brendan Constantine. Hey, Brendan, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Hello, Tim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I, I mean, I've been planning to have you on at some point since we started this broadcast. I'm glad we could finally, finally do that because um, I just love your work, um, and I and I always have. Well, and, and it really stands out, you know, among the poetry scene in Los Angeles. Um, and so uh, let's let's start out with a poem. What do you want to read first? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I thought I would read uh, the poem that's forthcoming in Rattle. Would that be all right? Yeah, that's perfect. Actually, just came out. I got the um, box on my uh, on my porch yesterday. I don't know if you've seen it, copy made it to you yet, but but it's oh here no, for not us. yet. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, this is a poem called "A Tour de Force." I got a book and can't make myself read it, even though my lover swears it's good, even though the cover says we might all beautifully belong somewhere. Imagine if everything you saw was printed inside your skull where people could see it after you died. When you do a lot of cocaine, it feels like that's true. Like the gallery is struggling to stay open because pipes keep breaking and the floor is always wet. That's what I remember, anyway. It's been a while since I had enough money to be that beautiful and echoing. Of course, you can't find anything in my head that looks like a sunset or a toy horse. It's all just goo in there. That's what memories become, dark water and milk. You could no more read it back than you could drink the ink from a novel and know who loved who. That was uh, a tour de force from uh, Rattle number 73 
which is just out for subscribers and should be arriving any day now if it hasn't yet. Um, so, Brenda, that, that's sort of a good segue poem to just my usual question, which I'd like to know is how people got into poetry and, and how you became a poet. Like, what was it that that drew you into writing and, and why this and not other um, not other genres? Like, like, can you tell a story about how you became a, became a poet? Because that's, that's always interesting to hear. Whew. I'm just... My only uh, hesitation is I'm scrambling to uh, to give you the short version. <laughs> I, I come from a family of artists, and I think it was naturally assumed that I would be uh, that I would follow some art form or another. My parents put a, a big emphasis on it. I mean, they considered the art as much a tool for communication as anything else, and they were both actors. And I think they, uh, you know, I. Certainly was a very theatrical child, uh, but I could also draw and paint. And um, I, I liked any class that wasn't mandatory, if you know what I mean. And um, uh, and there was a lot of poetry in the house where I grew up. And my, my parents would just as readily uh, give me a poem at bedtime than they would necessarily a story. And so it was always there, but I didn't really notice it. I mean, it, it, uh, I, I tend to think that I came to poetry fairly late after I tried a bunch of other things. Uh, what what seems to have been the most significant about poetry was that, and, and perhaps some of the listeners today can identify with this, it was, it was the thing I stayed with after it got difficult, after it became work. Um, you know, I had, you know, I'd had a knack for a lot of things, you know, drawing and painting. But when I really had to learn the subtleties of shading and depth, that it got too difficult and I backed off. I love photography and seemed to have a knack for that. But as soon as I had to learn sort of the mathematics of light density, I backed away. Uh, acting, you know, I loved doing. But once I really had to, you know, live with a part and you know, understand subtext and memorize pages and pages of text. I realized I don't want this more than anything. Poetry, however, when I was in my late twenties was the thing that after it got difficult, after all the encouragement dried up, after people stopped saying good boy, uh, after I'd been confronted with not just how much I didn't know, but a sense of how much I would not live long enough to learn. And I still wanted in. I thought, okay, this is it. This is the thing. And I was about, uh, I was about 27 mm -hmm. at the time, and uh, and I've been, I've been hooked ever since. And, and what was it about the poetry in particular, though? I mean, I'm wondering if it has anything to do with like the, you know, that your your parents were actors and you came from that family, which is, you know, every perf every poem is a kind of performance, like a performance of voice in the same way, and it's about mm -hmm. controlling the rhythms of speech and the music that comes out as we talk. And I don't know, like, like what was it? I don't know. I mean, you mentioned, you know, other things got too detailed, but, but when poetry got too detailed and too technical, he stuck with it. And, and what do you think was it though? That like, like why poetry and not something else, you know? That's a good one. Um, I would have to say, I mean, I, I don't know that I can completely explain that one, um, but it felt the most intuitive of of the art forms, uh, you know that that had drawn me, and uh, wow, why why poetry over everything else? Uh, the maybe because uh, well, I knew that the performance end of it was very strong, mm -hmm. was a very strong draw, and unlike professional acting. I didn't have to wait for an audition. I didn't have to wait for some indifferent machine to sort of make up its mind when I was going to perform my art. You know, even, even a painter is sort of dependent upon some sort of gallery show, but I'd noticed that when I got into poetry, I could walk into virtually any coffee house in Los Angeles, sign up and present my work. Um, and that was very attractive. Also, uh, the communities of poetry were really interesting. I think that poets are so used to being sort of marginalized and are amazed to be invited anywhere that at least the communities of poetry that I inhabited were enormously encouraging and everybody was sort of on each other's side. I mean, certainly there was competition, but it wasn't saber-toothed. It was 
you know, you genuinely were interested in what everybody had to say and what they were bringing and what they were reading and, and that kind of thing. At least that that's my, my recollection. And what's kept me here is a kind of emotional clarity that I just haven't been able to achieve anywhere else. I haven't stopped drawing pictures or, or taking, uh, taking photographs or, or uh, pursuing any of the other art forms. I haven't stopped doing it, but poetry is the one where I feel the greatest wingspan. And I don't know that I will ever completely understand why. Yeah. Yeah, the greatest wingspan. That's a great way to put it. Um, do, let's do, uh, I'm going to make sure we keep going through poems and, and talking more. Let's do another poem. What do you want to do next? Okay. Um, uh, do an older poem. I'm thinking about my father a lot lately, and this is a this is a poem that was inspired by him, and uh, it's called "Before the Flood." This isn't completely based on him, but I couldn't have written it uh, without him. Before the flood, my father remembers nothing or rather he remembers where it used to be. See that building? When I was a kid, there was nothing there. And next door where the school is, nothing. We walk through his hometown, down a street with an Indian name, no Indian lives to translate. It means dream river, he says, or rambling, confused river. I used to know. No one believes their parents were children. That is, you need more than their word. They have to do something, stifle laughter, cry into their hands, stand tiptoe. We all look younger on tiptoe. My father peers over a fence, another new building. This was all sand, he says, for Bethlehem, Bethlehem steel. His shoe is untied. He bends to lace it. I almost help. Later, I reach for his hand at a crosswalk. Let's go back, he says, to how it was. No, to the house, I need to lie down. We turn and the town surges under our feet, comes over us in a wooden tide. I get my arms under his, kick for both of us. He doesn't try, doesn't speak when his house goes by. And that was before the flood from uh, Brendan's um, second book, I believe, Calamity Joe from Red Hen Press. Um, there it is, Calamity Joe. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, just It's a wonderful poem and wonderful. I was hoping that was one of the ones that, that stood out from that book that I just loved. Um, and it, it ties in a little bit. Maybe we should just go here already um, to your work um, in, in Dimension My Darling to people um, in elder care centers. And, um, yes. and, and, and teaching there, um, can you, can you explain a little bit about what, what you do and, and how it works and how you got into doing that and, and why that's meaningful for you? Well, the, the work in elder care centers, uh, a hundred percent of the credit goes to an amazing poet named Gary Max Glazner, who started the Alzheimer's poetry project. And as a result of my work with, uh, Red Hen Press, uh, I found myself, uh, at a table uh, in a restaurant with him, uh, both I and Doug Kearney uh, were introduced to Gary Glazner and we, we, we had lunch at this uh, cafe. And he was telling us about a way that he had uh, developed of sharing poetry uh, with folks that had uh, uh, dementia and similar conditions. A way to create an experience of poetry that was sort of, um, uh, it was a poetry workshop, a poetry reading, a kind of poetry play where you could involve everyone in the room and give them an experience of poetry. If they were up to it and uh, able to, uh, to still navigate their thoughts, then you could engage them in writing. If they were a little more progressed in their condition, uh, you could still engage with them and... Uh, and, and share poetry with them and uh, share uh, connections with them. And he, you know, he didn't just have one skill or, or one approach to doing this. He had many. And 
for the next hour, he sat with Doug and I and told us all about what he was doing. And then said, "Is this? does this sound like something you'd love to do? And we said, sure, this, this sounds very interesting. Sure, we'd love to do this sometime. He said, great, I'll get the check. And Doug and I looked at each other and went, what, what's happening now? And I, we said, is something happening? He says, yes, I chose this restaurant because it's next to an elder care center and you're coming with me and this is your first day doing this. Oh, wow. And cut to 20 minutes later, I don't know for anybody that knows Doug Curdy, uh, Doug, if you're, if you're watching, I know you remember this, cut to about 20 minutes later and Doug and I were arm in arm, do si doing in the middle of a room surrounded by seniors at the center and uh, we were singing Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night while Gary clapped and everybody in the room sort of cheered. I mean, it was an amazing experience and we wrote poetry that day and uh, we recited poems and, uh, and, and, and broke a real sweat and uh, it, was, it was amazing. And so for the next few years after that, I started uh, visiting other centers if I was touring the country for for a book or something, I would make a point of finding where the elder care centers were in whatever city I was in and, and visiting those. I think there's actually a few videos of those that, hmm. that have ended up online. Um, and it was, it, it was very, very exciting work. And also does not require that you have any sort of a degree, um, you know, in, in, <laughs> in, in behavioral sciences or, uh, you know, or uh, or Alzheimer's or or any of those conditions. It just required a love of poetry and a willing to uh, to get up and share it as enthusiastically as you could. If you're able to make eye contact, you can do this kind of work. Yeah, and it's such valuable work too. I mean, I imagine that that it really helps people that are there. Um, you know, have something you know moving them forward. And, you know, we could do a whole session on it. I mean, some of the connections. Uh, and by connections, I'm, I'm referring to experiences of sitting with a stranger, somebody who, for the most part, people have stopped talking to and who has gotten used to not being spoken to or engaged. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you two are very much in a moment together and they're aware that somebody is listening. And, uh, and because you're doing, you're sharing poetry together, um, What's coming out of them is charged and excited and um, um, uh, as H.D. Wells said, it runs gloriously free of the trammels of precision. Uh, it's just raw. Um, you know, I, I had the experience of, you know, uh, being in a room and um, starting a poem and realizing that this that a number of the people in the room had had better educations than I had. And while they couldn't tell you what they had for breakfast that day, they'd all been raised with a great deal of poetry. So all I had to do was um, uh, um, start a poem by Shelley uh, to, uh, to say, I met a, tra a traveler from an antique land and... Uh, the next thing I knew, the one person in the room said, you know, two vast and trunkless legs of stone. And we began to do Osmandius uh, together, you know, and I, you know, and um, right, right all the way to I am Osmandius, king of kings, look on my work, you know. Um, and uh, it happened with Robert Louis Stevenson. I could begin, I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me. And somebody in the room who hadn't spoken for three days would go, Oh, what can be the use of them is more than I can see, you know, and mm -hmm. the next thing, you know, and they were out suddenly and engaged and present. And, you know, what was reported to me later from the folks that worked at these facilities was, you know what, they stayed out the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like I said, we could do a whole session, but there was there was one lady I remember who um, uh, who didn't recognize any of the visitors that had come to see her. She'd stopped. Um, uh, she'd stop really uh, talking to anybody, but we did an afternoon of poetry and just having a conversation on what things you, you know, I just said, what's a beautiful thing. That was a question that Gary told me to ask in these situations. And I would just ask everybody in the room, can you tell me one beautiful thing? And, you know, 10 minutes later, this woman is telling me about, um, 
being a child in Brooklyn during the Great Depression and going to visit all of the jewelry stores because they had no customers and they would just sit there sort of bored all day smoking mm -hmm. And they would let her come in and try on the rings and tiaras and whatnot. And she would get to be a princess for an afternoon. And I thought, does her family know these stories? You know, you know what? It was it was stunning. Yeah. I mean, every time I hear you talk about it um, and, and other people, too, it just seems like it has such a tremendous effect. Um, and so Carlton Johnson on the, in the chat window found the website, which I should have had handy. It's L's Poetry, A-L-Z Poetry. Right. Dot com. If anyone would like to get involved and participate. Um, but but has this like caught on and expanded since um, your time working with this, which was you know, oh, several years ago? Uh, absolutely. Like, you know, what's Gary the state is, of it now? Yeah. As Gary is still very very busy. Uh, I haven't uh, spoken to him in a little while, but I know that the project thrives and that you know it makes it sound like it's some sort of um, uh, uh, like it's an you know an, an initiative with you know with. That somewhere there's a, a room with a huge map on the wall with, with somebody, and it's not like that. But but uh, but what Gary created has caught on, and now there are people, um, you know, all over the place mm -hmm. who are just sort of following uh, these routines and uh, uh, procedurals that he's created and adding their own. I get. If, if you live in an average sized community, uh, there's an elder care center where you live, where, where, where Gary's work uh, has, had, has had some sort of an effect. Somebody has probably uh, brought one of his projects or one of his, uh, one of his books uh, there to share with the rooms. And, they, and the folks, you know, I've never, you know, I never once encountered anybody that said, you know, oh, that was great, but please don't come back. They were... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was thrilled to have you. And then that work um, brought me to the attention of a gentleman named uh, Michael Beal. And in 2017, uh, I, uh, I started to do work uh, with people that have uh, Alzheimer's, some of whom have it as a result of dementia, but many of whom are dealing with it as the result of uh, misadventure or stroke or illness. And uh, so a lot of the stuff that I, you know, a lot of the... Um, uh, the chops that I picked up from working with Gary have now are now I'm, I'm now applying uh, to my work with people that have aphasia. Yeah, it, it's just such great work to do. Um, and my, my first experience teaching poetry at all was uh, when I was a counselor at a group home for mentally ill adults. It was adults with schizophrenia. And um, it was the same kind of experience where people who had just not really expressed anything of themselves for a long time and didn't and felt like nobody was listening. You know, we'd Mm. You know, there, there were other projects we do where we'd go out into the community and try to, like, you know, do things that, that kept them sort of having a life, you know. But, but there was still this sort of, like, going through the motion sense of it. And when we did poetry workshops, um, they just came alive in a way that I'd never seen before. And that was one of the things that made me feel like poetry was important, you know, and worth, worth spreading and, and running a poetry magazine even is because it has this strong effect on people. Um, so, so I just love hearing hearing about these projects that you do. I think too, if 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 you're not careful, if you if you study poetry, if you go to an introduction to poetry class, you can you can leave with the impression that it starts in various cultures as some sort of an amusement. And the truth of the matter is, is that it seems to be consistently uh, an aspect of cultural adolescence, where. Uh, once a spoken language is getting up and running and has been in effect for a few years, uh, once a written language likewise uh, is maturing, that uh, the whole tribe, the whole village discovered that they need a way to talk about special things. They discover that there are things that cannot be precisely named and they cannot be adequately described. Something drastic is called for, some means of embodying this elusive feeling. And it may be dance, it may be movement, it may be painting, um, but when it's language-based, it tends to be poetry or lyricism. Uh, and uh, and it, it happens because it's necessary. It comes about from culture to culture because it is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I think it evolved like with our minds and, and it's just something so central to, to what it is to be human. Um, 
I, I'm gonna hang up really quick and call you back because your connection is getting choppy, um, and it might just be we might get a better okay. server if I do that. So let me let me try one more time. I just hang up and call you back. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm just gonna hang up and then uh, call Brendan right back, and hopefully we will get a better connection. That helps sometimes. Let's see. Right. And back. We're here. Um, the uh, the video is not, so you still have to click that button. Although, um, yeah, I can bring it up. Yeah, bring up that video again. There we there go. There you go. Perfect. Okay, so hopefully this connection is better. Um, but yeah, uh, let's let, let's uh, move on to another poem though. And make sure we get a good number of them in. What do you want to read next? Okay. This is a, a poem that was sort of a, a farewell to twenty twenty. Uh, my thanks um, to the folks over at uh, Indolent Books and that sort of poem a day series that they were running, uh, What Rough Beast, and a subsequent series, Poems in the Afterglow. They, they took this piece and this, was, this is a poem about the year that we left behind. Uh, and I guess it feels like it should come next because uh, this is one of those poems where it's not so much narrative, uh, it's a little more raw. And I think perhaps considering what we were just talking about uh, and uh, why, you know, why we use poetry for things rather than just attempting to describe them. Uh, I tried to take full advantage of all of those principles here. So there's, there's a meter in here, there's uh, some hidden rhyme, there's, um, uh, uh, you know, broken syntax. And this is just called Poem December 31st, 2020. The year hangs on the back of a door, moves a little when we speak, is also a pair of shoes, a bowl of blue apples, the cord to some electric thing coiled in a drawer, is a lampshade turned yellow, turned to burn, a muddy turtle whose shell is God's hand cupped to one ear. The year is finally quiet, finally melted at the bottom of its pretty glass. Of all the times to ask a question like this, is 12 buttons down the front coming undone, coming to bed? Yes to everything, whatever way you like to be carried. A handful of sugar or black ants, which are the same thing has stopped moving to watch me work, watch me push the boat away from the jetty and sit back with you, already shipwrecked, already drowned. Still talking about the year is a conversation for later. When the chairs are put back, the orderlies huddled in a driveway, lifting their masks to smoke, and the smoke not fading, not going anywhere. You can't make me, no one makes anyone. It's all over but the overing. Is tire tracks in snow, a little bread left, not much. Is paralyzed from the waist up, one bell, now two bells, now three. Is outside naked again and half awake. Has learned to keep clothes in the car. <laughs> mm. I've been on moot for a while. Um, so let me um, start over again. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll cut that. We'll, we'll cut that out. Yeah, I was on mute. Sorry, everybody. 
um, I muted myself while I was looking up that poem. That was um, that poem was from Indula Books, and that was um, poem December thirty first, twenty twenty. So what I was saying um, before I muted myself was um, that my favorite book about writing is um, Zen and the Art of Archery, and um, and the the um, concept of not having too much willful will. And there's one passage in Zen the Art of Archery where they talk about um, how you should hold the bowstring like a child holds a proffered finger. And um, the, the child doesn't think, I will let this go now to hit the target, but it just lets it go. And that's what your poems do. Um, they sort of, they feel like they're playing so much um, with the idea and letting your mind run free um, and, and, and moving wherever the poem takes you. It's almost like the poem is playing with you, like, like that passage mm. from Zen and the Art of Archery does. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the way that... Um, that um, that that works for you like like what is your process like and how do you let go oh. enough to to not <laughs> to not overthink it oh i've i've tried for years to have a process i uh gosh i wish i had a process um well i i will say uh that uh i mean i'm fortunate enough to uh have made lots and lots and lots of mistakes. I mean, uh, every now and then I get asked to speak somewhere and they say, do you have any advice for the students? And my advice is always make lots of mistakes uh, and be willing to make them publicly. And, um, you know, the best, the best antidote for self-consciousness is to just be willing to make a complete fool of yourself. Uh, and, um, and this is part of, uh, my answer to you because I, I feel as though and, and a thing that I emphasize in my own workshop when I'm when I'm working with other folks we all want to nail it on the first go uh, even those of us that that like to work that like to scavenge and really work for a poem still when you're I mean when you're when you're writing I mean you are hoping that as you choose each word you know nanosecond by nanosecond of the words are coming that um that you're that you're going in some sort of a viable direction, but at the same time, you know, I know that um, I can't be too focused on the end, and I have to trust that uh, the best work and the more honest poem will come if I'm willing to get lost. Um, as David Bowie said in an interview, he likened it to sort of uh, stepping out, uh, you know, into the current. And as soon as you sort of felt your feet come out of the sand a little bit and you were just getting at the mercy of the tide, that was when you were probably about to do something really interesting. And, uh, and I've just had it demonstrated to me over and over and over again that if I, you know, if I held on too much, if I, you know, if I tried to force a poem into something like what I, you know, what inspired it, uh, so that I knew what the end note was going to be. And I, and I still write things having some sense of where I want it to end. Uh, all I'm saying is that so long as I don't have a death grip on that and I'm willing to let chance in, uh, that's always the more rewarding experience. Hmm. And uh, so, and sometimes the, and I've talked about this before in, in other venues, a lot of the times the poem, once I've, you know, got a few lines down, will start to reveal itself as though it already exists complete somewhere and that it's just out here in the ether a little bit. And that what I'm in fact doing with it is negotiating with it as to how it would like to come into this world, but it's there already. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's got one hand to its chin and going, well, I don't know about rhymed couplets, maybe maybe quatrains and a little open-ended, maybe I should have, you know, uh, maybe I should have something else, you know, I'm sort of going with it, going, okay, well, would you like, would you like to be double-spaced? Would you like, you know, do you think you're going to go on for two pages? We'll feel it, you know, and it just, but I mean, as silly as that sounds, it really is kind of like that. Um, another thing that I'll add, if you'll permit me, I'm uh, at risk of going on a tangent here, but I was just talking about this in the workshop environment. And the thing that I, I tend to emphasize a lot in workshops, particularly when I'm working with writers who have been jammed up, um, is to, uh, to keep in mind a couple of things. One, you know, if you've, if you've written three poems in your life, then you've probably had the experience 
of discovering that um, where you started and where you ended up were very different places. And that if you, you know, and that probably your best work involved getting lost at some point. And that that sort of bears out Richard Hugo's idea that the poem usually has more than one subject. There's the subject that gets you going, and then there's a subject that is discovered. And that discovered that that discovery is made by the poet. You know, some you're quite often during the process of writing, but it may also happen way later. But if what you're writing about is a thing that isn't necessarily going to reveal itself right away, if you trust that that's true, mm -hmm. then I think uh, a useful metaphor is enabled by remembering what the word stanza means. A stanza is an Italian word. It means room. The stanzas of the poem are the rooms of the poem. A poem is not a thing to solve. A poem is a place to dwell. Hmm. And so when you are writing a poem, you might want to think, you might want to build out that metaphor and acknowledge, ah, in order for the real subject to have a place to arrive, I may need to get a few rooms built. Then later on, when I do the remodel, you know, I can go, oh, this poem actually starts in the kitchen or this poem actually starts in the bedroom and I can eliminate all the other rooms that I started with. But I have to write them. I have to be willing to, you know, to start writing sort of blindly, just start building rooms and listen for the subject's knock. It'll knock on whatever it wants to enter. And, but I have to, the house already has to be under construction. You know, so viewed that way, a lot of pretense can go right out the window. You know, don't worry if you started a poem the same way a hundred times before. Don't worry if you think you're about to write about something you've written about a million times or something that epitomizes you, where people are going to look at this and go, oh, God, he's always writing about that. Don't spend any time with that. Just, you know, you know, in fact, I dare you to start three or four poems exactly the same way. Just let yourself get lost in there and then, you know, you can go back and you know, uh, and, and trim it later. Like I said, you can, you can start that poem in the bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, that, uh, that analogy of, um, and, and I, you know, I, I knew stanza meant room, but I never thought of it that much actually. And, uh, and, you know, you, you move through rooms too. You have doors and a lot of times the poem is sort of missing a door to another space. So it really, it really mm. is a perfect metaphor for the way poems move, across time even, you know, like it's a map between rooms and, and, and the way that you move, you know, it, it's like directions, like guiding you through rooms. It's, it's fascinating. Um, did we lose you? No, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> you froze for a second. Um, so let's read another poem. And I should say, if anybody has any questions um, from um, the audience, um, I'm watching both Facebook and uh, YouTube. So please do leave any questions you have in the chat window. Um, but let's do another poem, Brennan. What do you want to read next? This is a poem that um, I haven't read in a while. Um, and I have to thank uh, poet David Kirby uh, for championing uh, this poem. But if you're, <laughs> if you're the creative member of the family, uh, there are things that people are going to say to you throughout your life. Um, and they're at once complimentary and also uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, somebody will probably say to you at some point, well, I have a friend who's weird. You should meet him. <laughs> and uh, another thing that you get all the time is, where do you get your ideas? And I, I'm i always tempted to just sort of point to some corner of the room and go, uh, over, over there, you know. Um, so this is a poem called, Where Do You Get Your Ideas? And it's just made up of answers to that question that I haven't had the nerve to give. Where do you get your ideas? There's a little shop at the end of each sentence where I buy the next one. In a glossy catalog delivered every month from evil. My ideas come from a cave my father found in my mother. It was warm, he said, a fire already going. On the walls were paintings of more mothers. From fire, the word itself, from everything that could burn us in the moment of saying it. Ask me again. Now ask me why I asked you to ask me. Really, they just barge in whenever they feel like it. I haven't finished a dream in days. 
the first ones, came by ship. Stowaways, they nearly starved. Then someone found a sack of almonds and everyone survived. When they reached port, they could see in the dark. From chumps who aren't using them. From a vending machine outside the crime museum. From you, right now, you're giving me ideas. One of them is worth millions. Another is a small harp playing in your coat. Still, another is a balcony view of the parade. There were supposed to be dancers in flaming hats. You'll have to imagine them. From knowing when to stop, it was a few stanzas ago. At night, I form a church with my hands. Inside are the faces of people I've hurt. If I want to sleep, I must look each one in the eye. I don't make the rules. And another great poem. That was Brendan Constantine's uh, Where Do You Get Your Ideas? And um, there's so much play and fun in that poem. And then the serious turn at the end. Um, and I, I can imagine reading that in a... Um, you know, with a big audience, and then hearing sort of the, the palpable silence as you get to that last line, um, which which brings to me, you know, another question I was having is that you're you're such a good performer of poems, and you do it a lot. Um, Thank you. Thank you for saying. And and um, do, you, do you are certain poems um, work better for performance versus reading in the page? And do you write that way with that in mind at all? And do you pick poems based on that, or is it just you, you just do what what happens and there's no difference? Do you think? I like to think that anything I write can be read out loud uh, and, and that you don't need me to read it. You know, um, you know, I've certainly read, I've certainly written things. And while I was writing as a means of just sort of making myself feel better. So I won't give up on the poem. I've, I've had moments where I thought, Oh, maybe this will be a poem that works better silently, you know, in somebody's head. But I always hear the poem in my head when I'm working on it. And I'd like to think that, you know, that any poem I write, you know, with one or two tries, you could, you could read it out loud and it would work. Um, and that counts even for poems where I've broken subject verb agreement, or I've decided that it's a poem where the text wants to be all over the page or where, where, you know, the sequence of lines might not appear at least immediately intuitive. I feel like, yes, but even if you just were to jump in and read it wrong, it would work. Um, because I do, I do think poetry should be heard. And, um, and I haven't come across a lot of poetry by other people that didn't work. It, you know, it, you know, it may not always result in the most pleasant experience of poetry or the most flowing experience of poetry, but I'm willing to try it. And I'm always intrigued by you know, maybe that's because I didn't have anybody standing over me telling me I was doing it wrong, you know, and it's very, it's, it's very possible that I'm accidentally enjoying things that I'm not supposed to be enjoying. But, um, but personally, uh, I always hear the poem in my head. Certainly, if I'm giving a live reading, I'm aware that there are some poems in a book or, or in a recent, you know, collection of poems that I'm, that I'm currently choosing from that may work better in one room than another. Um, so even when I'm asked to read someplace, if I've prepared a set in advance, I usually have uh, the set that I've prepared and then a whole bunch of what I call wild cards, mm -hmm. poems that I can drop into the set just in case the mood changes on me. And of course, you never know what you're going to proceed, you know, what you're going to follow. Um, you know, you, uh, uh, you know, with respect, you may be going up after another poet who struck a very, very different tone and maybe a very necessary and emotional tone. And there you are with only your funny poems, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I try to think, well, that's, you know, uh, and it's not just a question of like, oh, I'm following this. This is going to make my poems look bad. But I also don't want to, I don't want to ruin the note that the, the previous poet just set. You know, I think it's sometimes an act of respect, too, to be able to sort of change your set and go, oh, okay, they've created this lovely mood, you know, see what you can do to sort of, you know, enhance that or run with it or take it further or, or that kind of thing. So I will have those thoughts. I will absolutely, 
you know, think of it in those terms. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll say about that is I think however you read your poems is how you read them. And I do think that while it's probably smart if you're going to do a lot of reading uh, to people to try reading your work in different ways, but how you read your work is how you read your work. And if you get too concerned mm -hmm. with, you know, how you're going to sound and whether, you know, that kind of thing, I think you can drive yourself kind of crazy with that. My best advice to anybody is imagine that you were talking to a group of people uh, for the first time, but you were just sharing with them. You were just telling, you know, a story about something that happened in your childhood. If you, you know, however you might modulate your voice to just talk honestly with someone, uh, mm -hmm. that's how you should probably try to read your poem mm -hmm. is to just, you know, connect with them that way. Just no less than if you were two people in a whole, you know, in a, in a doctor's waiting room and you turn to the person next to you and said, you know, it's a funny thing about the magazines in this place. And you just started to deliver your poem that way. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, you know, there's all that talk about the poet voice and, and the way, um, you know, a poet, a, a poem is sort of a special space where language is heightened and different than regular speech. And so I think there's a tendency to, um, heighten the voice and make it performative. Um, which you do, but in a way that feels very natural. Um, and, and so that's how, is that you're thinking of? You're thinking of talking to, um, as if you're just telling a story to the people in that room. And that's the. Yeah. And that if it sounds artificial, it's not so much artificial so much as I'm, I'm trying to speak in a way, uh, you know, as I would, like I said, to people that I don't know very well, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I imagine because, <clears throat> Because they're, they're giving me something very precious. They're giving me their attention. And there's a great deal competing for our attention these days. The easy argument, and the one I hear a lot, is that what competes for our attention these days is largely crap, which is not true. Actually, there's a great deal of really important, urgent things that are competing for our attention right now. And if you were listening to me, I'm sort of like, I need to make you comfortable. Even if the poem I'm going to read is one that I know will make you uncomfortable you know, or that, that is, you know, can't, you know, can't afford to pull any punches still, I've invited you in, you know, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I'm at once your, I'm at once your host, but I'm also your guest. And so, you know, in there somewhere, that's where I find the register, which I'll, you know, with which I'll, I'll read to an audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's read another poem. Uh, what, what do you want to do next? Let's do, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's do, um, this is a poem uh, that I've read a couple of times lately, but I'm, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm having some luck with it. Um, and by luck, I mean, I'm feeling connected to it. This is just called Unscheduled Poem. The next time you have the falling dream, try to spread your arms like the letter Y. Not only will you land easier, you'll hang on to the picture longer, your grandparents in their flying suits. When someone says they've had a bad day, tell them it's because Mercury is in Petrograd. When they correct you, say no, it's actually the old name for St. Petersburg. When they walk away, be sure to shake your head. This is the time we did not agree upon for poetry. You remember, it was now. The last time we met like this, we were strangers, not like today, the two of us intimate as books. Back then, you were all about anonymity. And I recall thinking I was in the absence of true genius. This is much better. We should do whatever more often. When something vanishes, February, a voice, the wine, believe it has a heaven because it does. Understand what makes it hard to see is time and time is not distance. It is instance, which means it is always due. The first time is unknowable. Just accept it. Here are some other things to accept. Lambs, string, bruises, 
the number 10, a sister, nothing, different nothing. Here is a riddle. There is no death if you cooperate with death. Do not cooperate with death. Also, right now, this is the falling dream. Hmm. That was unscheduled poem. Um, let's take a couple questions from the audience, Brendan. Sure. Um, so Richard Westheimer asks, um, when drafting your poems, how important is it to your process that you read your drafts aloud? And, and just in general, what's your what's your process like as far as the the nitty gritty of drafts and and um, you know how many poems do you just abandon and things like that? And, and do you read aloud when you write, like Richard Richard suggests? I do uh, read the poems aloud from time to time. Uh, although while I'm writing it, I'm I'm always sort of hearing it in my head. Uh, if there's if there's anybody here that was a kid during the '70s, you'll probably remember there used to be a toy called a Speak and Spell, and uh, it was one of the first sort of digital toys. And you could it was this big heavy uh, plastic uh, uh, tablet, and uh, if you typed a word into it, it would say the word. And it was one of the first digital voiced toys. But it didn't matter what you put in there. If you put in magnolia or butterfly, it would come out butterfly. And uh, sometimes when I'm writing poems, I hear that voice. And I try to imagine the poem in the speak and spell voice. Because I know that if the poem seems to work in the speak and spell voice, then it really doesn't need me to deliver it. Hmm. You know, because I'm aware that there's a subtleties in the language, there's inflection, an emphasis that I may think is in the language, and that I actually fail to write down, you know. Um, but if the thing can work dead, if it can work totally monotone, if it does not need me to deliver it, then, you know, and I find that is a, a useful litmus test. And so I will absolutely... Uh, do that. Uh, I will absolutely try, you know, I always have a sense of what it's it's going to sound like. And sometimes I will read it aloud. I find reading aloud also works in the editing process, particularly if you have, uh, if you have a poem that's bugging you for some reason, you're not sure, you know, something's wrong. And, um, and I tell my students to do this a lot. You read the poem out loud, successively, like four or five times, and you may want to make sure you're alone. Because you want to do it in a full voice. You want to do it so that you can actually hear your voice ringing off the window pane. You do the poem out loud once. You do it again. You do it a third time. You do it a fourth time. Then you set the poem aside and you try to write the entire thing out entirely from memory without consulting your draft. Hmm. Chances are, if you leave anything out, it was probably fat. Hmm. And I find the experience of having read your work aloud and having had your own voice in there so that you were almost like you were learning a song, you know, that uh, subconsciously when you're trying to do it again from memory, you might find the truer rhythm of the piece and that truer rhythm will require removing certain pieces and, and that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll do that from time to time. Uh, have I ever abandoned a poem, you ask? Uh, I've abandoned lots of poems and I continue to abandon, but I don't throw anything out. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, I may decide to stop working on a thing, but I keep everything. Um, you know, I've got, you know, I've got terabytes of unfinished poems and poetry fragments and whatnot on my computer and tons of notebooks. I'm surrounded by them in this room right now that are just filled with like half poems and things that have X's through them. But I keep them because, you know, they're, they're a wood pile and they will, you know, I've had, you know, uh, I've had a lot of success going back and picking up a poem that's 20 years old and suddenly having the necessary epiphany 20 years later. Oh, this is what this poem is for. This is where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. um, a similar craft question uh, from Georgina Bard. Um, she asks, how do you keep the flow of the poem going if you just can't find a word that you don't want? Or does that never happen to you? Oh, sure it happens. How do you keep the flow going? Well, patience with yourself. We're always terrified, I think, of losing the scent. You know, you want to jump on it while you're inspired, you know, as particularly for anybody that struggles to find time to write. You know, it's like, well, I, you know, why would you why would you let go of the wheel then? You know, if you know, if you were, you know, if you wanted to keep a rhythm going and you were afraid that you were going to lose the rhythm. I have found that sometimes if I'm desperately trying to keep the rhythm of a thing or I find that the rhythm of the poem 
I mean, the rhythm has to work for the poem. It can't be the other way around. You know, it's the same of any formal conceit. The form has to drive the poem. The poem can't exist for the sake of, of the form. Um, and uh, it will, or well, it can, but you'll write a truer poem if it's the other way around. And you would think so, you know, so if you've got a rhythm that's working, it's driving the poem and suddenly that feels precarious so that you can't maintain it. Um, it would seem counterintuitive to stop working on it and step back. But I have found that if I do that, it, it usually is the right move because what's happened is my preoccupation with rhythm or any other formal conceit has become a kind of snow blindness. I am too focused on it. And I actually can't see the larger poem. I have to be willing to lose the scent a little bit, which I know is dangerous because you feel like, well, if I do that, I will lose the inspiration and I won't want to work on it. Or I'll lose sight of whatever that flash of gold was that got me chasing it in the first place. But, you know, if I, you know, sometimes I've got to, I do have to back away from it. If I'm not willing to do that, then what I will do is suspend working on anything else, keep that poem in my head, and what I'll start doing, and I've, I've had wonderful luck with this, start listening to music that feels like it has the rhythm I'm after. Now, this can backfire on you terribly, but, but I have found that it works really, really well from time to time. I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep that poem in my head, and have my notes out where I can see them, but I'm just going to sit and relax, take a breath, listen to music that has the same vibe. And sometimes I found that the momentum of that experience will sort of drive me back into the rhythm that I was after the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great answers to those questions. Thanks, Brian. A lot of great tips and advice um, in, in this podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, we have time maybe for another poem, then a little talk, and then one last poem. So two left, if that's okay. Um, All right. So what do you want your penultimate poem to be? Penultimate poem. Well, let's do um, let's do this one. This is a this is a poem called "What's Not to Love," and it came out of the experience of the pandemic. And um, um, and I'm, you know, and I, and I got, I, I got a very satisfying response to it. I, uh, this is one of those poems that, um, people were nice enough to acknowledge and, um, I think it's dangerous to be concerned with accessibility. I really do. Uh, but I think it's probably... But what has been useful to me, uh, if there's anything that I want selfishly for my work, it's not recognition, it's usefulness. I would like to be useful. Um, so um, some folks said they found this poem useful, and that, that's the nicest thing you can say to me. This is called, What's Not to Love? What's not to love about a broken bowl? Now two half bowls, still ready to hold what they can, even if that's nothing. What's not to love about weeds and weeds and weeds that crowd the yard and thrive amazingly on the same nothing? What's not to love about a virus crowding the blood, putting a doll of itself in each cell and sailing it away to find fortune in the heart? What's not to love about the dying heart with its four dark rooms full of grass and broken china, a sheeted piano about to play? What's not to love about a sonata played by a lonely child who would rather do anything else, sleep in a garden or pull up the flowers, who would rather be sick? What's not to love about reading aloud to someone fast asleep, about not stopping, not even when a bowl slides from the bed and crashes like a bell in water. That was What's Not to Love, and that was from Poetry, um, Poetry's November 2020 issue. Um, yes, it was. Yeah, and I, I wondered, you know, how it feels like you're sort of, um, you know, breaking out nationally lately. You had you're in Best American Poetry now, and on the Poem a Day thing, and in Poetry Magazine. Um, 
can you talk a little bit about like the the sort of slow climb up the ladder because it felt like you were when i moved to los angeles you were like a los angeles legend already but it felt kind of regional <laughs> and um, oh my gosh <laughs> and uh, and now wow. it, you know you're sort of breaking out nationally how how does that feel and um i don't know and, I, I, I'm reminded of, of Mitch Hedberg saying to an audience, this is all part of my get rich slow plan. <laughs> um, this is, um, well, like I said at the, before I read the poem, it is enormously gratifying to feel useful. And I'd like to think that when a poem, you know, when if, if, if the work is connecting or the work is coming back to me in some way, that means it's circulating. And what's interesting about poetry is that I've got nothing to sell. You know, um, you know, for those of you who are just starting in this game, if you get published anywhere, I mean, sometimes they pay you, but your poem, I mean, every time your poem gets read, you know, you're, you're not collecting royalties on that. That's not a thing. You know, um, what you hope for, at least what I hope for, is that, uh, you know, is that your poem is going to find somebody that needed to read it. Like Paul Salon said, every poem is a message in a bottle. Um it stands to reason that if you just keep flooding your little bit of the sea with these messages, that perhaps they will pile up, you know, um, and you will go crazy if you look for evidence of that. Um, and uh, my mother has a principle that I much admire. She said, uh, don't look for yourself in the art. Look for the art in yourself. Because if you're looking for yourself in it, you're going to be like that, the story of the, the person running down the beach of paradise, running faster and faster and looking over their shoulder, hoping to catch a glimpse of themselves on the beach of paradise. You'll go mad, you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, it's nice of you to say that I seem to be going national. I have been lucky enough that uh, a handful of journals of late have, that have, you know, a wider circulation have, have taken my work. Uh, uh, I think the last poem I'm going to read today is a poem uh, that uh, that ended up having two film adaptations, a chorale adaptation, and in fact, actually, a young filmmaker just made a third version of it, a poem called the "The Opposites Game." Um, that's a poem. Uh, also, uh, I don't mind telling you that um, because of its subject matter, it's a poem that circulates more in the wake of mass shootings. Mm -hmm. So if I get a note on Twitter or somebody's written to me recently about that poem, it usually means there's been a shooting somewhere. So that's not what I would call an accolade. That's not, you know, that's that's not necessarily good news, you know, and 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 a thing like that will absolutely wipe the smile off your face once you're, you know, ready to pat yourself on the back for being such an important poet. Um, you know, um it's uh uh, so I'm I'm very pleased with, you know, uh, I, I like to think that I've been useful, that people have found things in the poem that, that they can use. Um, but at the same time, I really can't. Um, Donna Tartt said a really interesting thing a few years ago in an interview. Uh, she said she was um, she was afraid or wary. I hope I'm doing justice to this, Donna, uh, of being a connoisseur of her own work. Hmm. She just she embodied that as really dangerous. You know, um, and, uh, you know, once you're there, you've sort of missed the whole point of what you were doing in the first place. You know, um, so I, I my interest is on the next poem. And, you know, am I going to, you know, uh, and what is the experience going to be of, of writing that? And um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and I'm continuing to send work out, but I don't just I don't just send work to magazines that have large circulations. I send lots of local stuff and people that are. You know, people that are uh, that just ask me for a poem for for something, or if I, or if I, you know, if I go online and I see a journal that looks interesting to me, and the, the editor seems to be making really interesting choices, and I like the poems that they're publishing in it, it doesn't matter to me if four people are reading it, or you know, I mean, if if they're open for submission, I'm gonna go, um, you know, I'm gonna give it a shot, and um, and everybody's got something to teach me. You know, that's another thing. Um, uh, I used to be very militant in my opinions about what was the good art and what was the bad art. And, and I still run into fellow poets that, that seem to be very worried that bad poetry is going to take over all the good poetry. And poets who are bad will get all the recognition and 
poets who who are good will vanish from the earth. And, you know, and I used to I used to buy into that. And I used to think you need to be like, OK, here's the good stuff over here and this needs to be celebrated. And here's the bad things. And of course, I'm qualified to recognize what the bad stuff is. And whenever I draw those lines in the sand, all I do is I isolate myself. I've come to find that that absolutely everybody's got something to teach me, that if there's a poet or, or kind of poetry that bugs me or gets under my skin and annoys me, I should probably investigate that. And it probably has something more to do with my insecurity and that that poet probably has you know i may think i'm pissed off what i probably am is inspired and that i should probably go and investigate that um and uh and see if there's if there's something that i that i can learn from from that experience uh that seems to be the way to go yeah, yeah. Well, it's just this this whole conversation is full of such great advice, and and that's among them, and um, and, and incredibly useful poems too. I think we you know we've published so many poems about school shootings, and and this one, the opposites game, seems to capture it in a way and be useful for people, like you say, in a way that um, a few poems other you know come close to. So um, let let's hear this opposites game, and uh, and we'll finish off with that. I think uh, the person for whom it is dedicated had signed in to the, the reading today. Uh, this is dedicated to uh, my friend Patricia Mache, who I haven't seen in a couple of years, um, but uh, she made this poem possible. Uh, it was specifically because she invited me to participate um, uh, at an event for Gun Violence Awareness Day. Uh, that this poem uh, came to be, and it was because uh, of the fact that uh, she is an actual hero, and um, and when a hero asks you to do something, uh, you do it. Um, so, and the only other thing I'll say about this is that this is also uh, I also have to thank uh, my students uh, uh, at Windward School and a handful of other schools where I was working at the time. Uh, the events in this poem uh, really happened, uh, you know, and. Uh, and so the opinions of students are represented in this piece. And uh, the last thing I said, you know, William Carlos Williams said that you should never explain a poem, but that it will always help. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, the, other th the other thing is, is that this poem is based on a prompt that I started giving. And if anybody wants to try this prompt, it works great, particularly if you're jammed up. You take a piece of writing by somebody else and you just start saying the opposite of whatever they say. And you can actually map it out on the page exactly like they're doing it. If they say, you know, uh, if they say, I, you know, I walked all night, then you go, you know, we slept half the day. Whatever it is, you just turn it on its head. So uh, this poem came about because I was playing that game with a group of students. This is called The Opposites Game for Patricia Mesh. This day, my students and I play The Opposites Game with a line from Emily Dickinson. My life had stood a loaded gun, it goes, and I write it on the board, pausing, so they can call out the antonyms. My, your, life, death, had stood, will sit, a, many, loaded, empty, gun, gun. For a moment, very much like the one between lightning and its sound, the children just stare at me. And then it comes, a flurry, a hailstorm of answers. Flower, says one. No, book, says another. That's stupid, cries a third. The opposite of a gun is a pillow, or maybe a hug, but not a book. No way is it a book. With this, the others gather their thoughts, and suddenly it's a shouting match. No one can agree. For every student, there's a final answer. It's a song, a prayer, I mean a promise, like a wedding ring, and later, a baby. Or what's that person who delivers babies? A midwife? Yes, a midwife. No, that's wrong. You're so wrong, you'll never be right again. It's a whisper, a star. It's saying I love you into your hand and then touching someone's ear. Are you crazy? Are you the president of stupid land? You should be. When's the election? It's a teddy bear, a sword, a perfect, perfect peach. Go back to the first one. It's a flower, a white rose. When the bell rings, I reach for an eraser, 
but a girl snatches it from my hand. Nothing's decided, she says. We're not done here. I leave all the answers on the board. The next day, some of them have stopped talking to each other. They've taken sides. There's a flower club and a kitten club and two boys calling themselves the snowballs. The rest have stuck with the original game, which was to try to write something like poetry. It's a diamond. It's a dance. The opposite of a gun is a museum in France. It's the moon. It's a mirror. It's the sound of a bell and the hearer. The arguing starts again, more shouting, and finally, a new club. For the first time, I dare to push them. Maybe all of you are right, I say. Well, maybe. Maybe it's everything we said. Maybe it's everything we didn't say. It's words and the spaces for words. They're looking at each other now. It's everything in this room and outside this room and down the street and in the sky. It's everyone on campus and at the mall and all the people waiting at the hospital and at the post office. And yeah, it's a flower too, all the flowers, the whole garden, the opposite of a gun is wherever you point it. Don't write that on the board, they say. Just say poem. Your death will sit through many empty poems. And that was the opposites game. Just a wonderful poem. I I, um, I, I love the poem. Every time I hear you read it, it feels uh, it's just an amazing poem. Thanks, Brendan Constantine, for being the guest today and for sharing your Thank work you. with us. And uh, there's so much, to, so much uh, to teach us. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now. Yep. Have a good night. So it was Brendan Constantine um, with a bunch of poems and um, his new manuscript, um, which he is still working on right now, but uh, sharing some poems from those. Now, as always, we're going to move to the open lines. So I'm going to put up a splash screen and some music, and I will be right back in just a moment. The um, the prompt for this week was to write a, um, a portmanteau poem, poems that use portmanteaus or make up your own portmanteaus or something like that. That was the prompt. You're also welcome to share poems about um, current events, of course, any recently publications you have, anything you'd like to share at all. So feel free to share them at the open lines. This is how the open lines work right here. That's not right. Um, there. So email your poems, if you haven't yet, to open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com. And then, um, and then I'll have the poems to show on the screen like we were with Brendan. Um, then call in over Skype or the phone to read. So pick one or the other. Skype is rattle poetry, all one word. Just put that in the search bar. And um, say hello on the chat message, and I'll say, um, um, I'll say, you're online, and then uh, it's your turn. So that's how you get in the line. And then for the phone number, it is eight one eight eight five zero seven seven two seven. That's eight one eight eight five zero seven seven two seven. Just call and let it ring a few times, then hang up, and that'll put you in the line for the uh, the poems. Now call in the order that the uh, requests were received. So so far we have Vicky Miko. Um, we have. Uh, Richard Westheimer, Nivita de Karthik lined up so far. So call in right now if you'd like and send me poems by email. And I'll be right back in just a moment.
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Um, so as I mentioned, the prompt for this week was to uh, write a portmanteau poem. And those are, of course, two words um, joined together to make one word. I didn't know the uh, etymology of that. It was, um, it was actually Lewis Carroll who coined it um, for a description of what he did um, in Jabberwocky. And so it was his... Um, um, metonymy. It was using using a portmanteau, which was a word um, which meant carry, um, mantle carrier, and um, you know port, and then mando is a mantle. And um, and and Lewis Carroll borrowed this word um, to call what he was doing portmanteaus, and that's where it came from from the poem Jabberwocky. So that's pretty interesting. And um, here's my quick one. I tried to do a short one again. Still working on these uh, the short style sometimes. And uh, this is my portmanteau. Here it is. Let me drop this. Okay, portmanteau. It's portmanteau. Sits in the mouth of the great foot river. Daily the tide blunders by. Yes, there should be five. But even the one goes mostly unnoticed, fanning out as it does into the finest silt, carrying the mantle of the sea. That is my portmanteau poem. And uh, Megan has a, has a good one, too. Well... A good one, unlike mine. And this is incel. And uh, you'll, you'll find what incel is. If you don't know what an incel is, um, you'll find that out in the course of reading this poem. So here's Megan's poem from the prompt. Incel. I hate this, but I remember his name. When I say it, there's a metallic spark in my mouth that reminds me of the first time I learned the word Nazi and how the hiss of that second syllable was serpentine and slithered into my synapses. I don't remember a single name of the victims, and that fact feels like an involuntary betrayal. The word incel is a portmanteau of involuntary and celibate. There's a kindness inherent there, an understanding, a pardon, like maybe there was nothing he could do, maybe some young thing should have handed him her softness, the way a mother hands a crying child a lollipop. Hush now. It's a funny word, involuntary. It might make one think of a woman walking on sidewalk on a spring day with purpose in the swiftness of her feet, with a bullet makes her a punchline, when a bullet makes her a punchline, a period at the end of a stupid story, until the planet of who she was could fit on the head of a pin. I read it. I'm sorry. The manifesto. I read it. It was nonsense. It was nothing, and I recall none of it. And here it comes again, his name, that metal taste, and the, that word, incel, the femininity of it, like it could be a girl's name, and I wish I knew yours. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to say it until it feels like the only word I've ever heard. And that is Megan's prompt poem for this week, Incel. Um, and let's see what you have for us now. Uh, first up, let's go to uh, Vicky Miko. Well, we'll try Vicky in a little bit. Maybe um, she didn't answer that time, but let's try. Um, let's go to um, Richard Westheimer. We didn't get to Richard last week, I don't think. So let's let's get Richard now. Hey, Richard, how you doing? Good. I, I had my. Well, we'll try Vicky. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. No problem. How you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, I just loved. As I think everybody on YouTube just loved that interview. It was yeah, uh, yeah. Brendan's someone special. It's it's really cool talking to him. And um, and imagine like a whole room of of students has him as his te their teacher every year. You know, that's pretty cool at the Windward yeah. School there where he works. Yeah, I mean, he he's really sort of developed a sense of his own poetics that's really great to listen to. Mm -hmm. and, and that last poem, "The Opposites," is just stunning. Yeah, that was uh, that was one of the only times I've ever asked. There are two poems I asked for after hearing them in a reading, um, and one was uh, Patricia Smith's Motown Crown, where I just came over and said, "Hey, is that poem unpublished? <laughs> Send me that." And then the other one was um, is the Opposites Game, and Brent said, "Oh, it's already published." Sorry. You're right. <laughs> and so, um, but both ended up in Best American Poetry, so I guess we have similar tastes. Uh, I mean, that's just clearly uh, just amazing poems. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, Megan's poem too. Not no no shade on yours, but that <laughs> that one that you read of hers that could find a home. That's uh, a. That's yeah. really yeah, powerful. she should start publishing these, but but she just gives them to me <laughs> the the morning of the show, and that's all she's okay. doing with them right now. Um, but uh, anyway, what did you want to share with us, Richard? Um, so I'll share my um, uh, a poet's respond poem this week, the Ouroboros. Okay, let me uh, let me get that up then, and what, explain what it's about before as I do that. Okay, uh, well, first I'll say what Ouroboros is vaguely. It's a uh, Egyptian iconography. It's a snake or serpent eating its own tail, or occasionally occasionally gratifying itself orally. Um, so it's sort of 5,000 year old sort of iconography of Egypt, which has nothing to do with the poem. And, and uh, what was the uh, new story that, that inspired it? Um, so actually what inspired it was that, uh, last sa- Sunday morning, I went down to our Creek and it was full of sewage. Oh, wow. Uh, and so originally it wasn't going to be a, uh, poet's respond poem, but I looked online and they're like sewage leaks all over the place on the news. So I just picked one of them hmm. and, you know, from the same week and, yeah. and it, it, it's like only news to the eight or 10 people who are in that immediate watershed. But when it's, it's just, it happens all the time. And, and it just, as the poem unfolded, it you know, made me think of all of the tiny little news stories that are not news. Mm-hmm. They're just ordinary you know, or ordinary messing with people's lives with, you know, toxic smoke or sewage or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a friend told me last night that the the bombing at the Kabul airport was over a sewage, uh, open sewer line. Oh, which really? I didn't hear that. Complicated mm-hmm. things. So yeah. anyway, mm-hmm. so Ouroboros, here we go. Okay. Upstream from me, a sewer lift station took a dump in the creek that runs behind our house. The snake brown water, home in better times to crawdads and water striders and clear to the rock bottom is now a dismal mix of gut worms and stench. It leaves a shit sheen on stepping stones, pools in a murk of others offal and dreck. The air spilling up from the bottoms in nauseating waves settles around us, especially after dark, I'll have to close the sash, forego the cricket lullaby and the breeze that rustles the curtains, seeps in to caress the sweat from my bareness. I'll drench dream latrine scenes, where I'll consider the ancestry of the deconstructed turds that stir below. People upstream don't know I see into their homes. Through all their orifices, they leak their lives into toilet traps, washing machine hoses, sink drains, where they dispose of burger spume, soap and shaving stubble, sugary pea, condom juice, shreds of snot rags. I shudder at it coming my way and awaken, my eyes and nose smarting from the fetter, and I am pissed off at all those ignorant slobs upstream from me, which prompts the question, who is downstream from me. Someone lives next to the refinery that cracked my gasoline. Someone sleeps by the coal ash pit my power plant spits out. Someone wakes to the ore trucks brawling by their mountain home. We're all like the Ouroboros, one day eating our own tails, the next day blowing ourselves, the next day being eaten by the same ignorant slob whose tail we just ate. This morning, I saw a heron waiting in the defilement. She vainly stabbed for prey in the mire and took off, empty-beaked, crud clabbering from her breast feathers. Overhead, she lit on a limb and splatted the path at my feet. A great poem. Always uh, vivid as always, Richard, and, and that makes for a, for a disgusting imagery in that poem. Yeah. Well. Um, did, did anyone figure out like what the source was for the, that sewage yeah. in your case? Yeah, it was a there was a lift station that somehow had a power surge and shut down. And actually, the author- authorities were very cooperative. You know, when I called them and let them know, you know, they tracked it down and mm-hmm. they came and tested the water. But there's not, you know, there's shit in my creek, and 
you know, it, it can rain for a year and there'll still be shit residue in there. So they, they, they will come back and test the water a year mm -hmm. from now. But, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's too bad here, but yeah. Thanks for writing and, and sharing that and poem. It's, every, it's everybody's story, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just these little stories. Um, I did have a uh, prompt poem from last week, if there's a time. Yeah, I yeah sure. It. I think we're in a time. We don't have a whole bunch of people lined up. So um, what uh, was this, uh, the pear tree? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so that and was the, the prompt. What was the prompt? Remind me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, unrequited love. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Not, not anything I've ever experienced. <laughs> um, the pear tree. If you would just yield the pears promised when I planted you, your photo showed limbs fruited, arrayed, ripening like emerald tears. All I've gotten from my tending are green leaves and those tender blossoms that tease me each spring. You are like that pear-shaped girl I mooned for in school. She played the guitar under the stars, her eyes like Neptune. We sang Laura Nero tunes with the gang, played gin late into the night, walked in the rain, reveled in the wet, and never kissed. Oh, very nice poem, The Pear Tree. Uh, thanks for sharing that too, Richard. Thanks. Thanks. You have a great evening. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. It's, uh, Richard Westheimer with The Pear Tree and uh, Ouroboros. And um, let's see. Um, let me uh, let me see. So I'll, I'll try Vicky again, Vicky Miko, and um, she sent audio too. So if if it doesn't work, we can get connected. I will play the audio. Right? Oh, she picked up. Let's see. Hey, Vicky. Oh, hi. Hello. How you doing? Let me. Uh... I'm I'm good. Am I, is uh, the connection okay? Yeah, the connection is great. So uh, what did you want to share with us tonight? Um, well, I have um, a prompt poem, and I sent you a recording of it. Um, but first, I wanted to ask a question. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, when I was, uh, I looked up a lot of these words mm -hmm. to make this poem, uh -huh. and I wanted to make certain that none of them have uh, taken on a, a new meaning mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, like like uh, racist or sexual or mm -hmm. you no know, I look at the urban dictionary and scrabble and slang but um, I was wondering if anybody else has encountered that because I, I do that all the time and I know that you say that a lot on, on um, your great um, uh, critique of the week you say, you know, don't overuse words. So try to think of something else. Mm -hmm. um, so I do that, and then <laughs> I wonder if these words are. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm looking through the poem, and I don't see anything that stands out to me. Um, but but it, that that is a difficult thing. I mean, you know, I'm um I'm starting to feel like where I'm not in touch with um, you know, the language of the day. Like they're like the things that that cool kids say, I no longer have any clue what oh, yeah. they mean. And I have to use the urban dictionary all the time. I'm in that phase of my life for sure. So I would not be the best person to check. Uh, but these look like words you all made up. So uh, I think it, I think it's pretty safe. Probably. Okay. <laughs> I put, uh, uh, I put a definition of them at the bottom. So if, if you want to just tune in the, um, the recording, that's fine. Okay. So you want me to play the recording instead? Sure. Okay, I could do that. Okay, so I guess I'll hang and up. And I have you. a Haga. I have a Haga there, oh, too. Oh, the Haga there, too. Yeah, why don't you read the Haga, and then I'll play the recording that you sent. Okay, the okay. Haga is a universal cycler's grape. The passer asks, are you all right? Oh, I love that. A universal cycler's gripe. The passer asks, are you all right? And then there's another photo, um, always great photos from Vicky, too, of uh, someone with a bicycle here. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Vicky. Thank you. Great night, every word. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Okay, so that was Vicky Miko, and she wanted us to play the audio. Let me see if I can get this um, set up quickly. Um, okay, 17. Just one second. Is this going to work? Okay, so this is going to work. This is, um, let's see, how much time? 
Okay, so 45 second clip. This is uh, this poem that Vicky sent. And now that I have it there, I can put it on the screen here and we can hear this poem too. So here is the recording and the poem. This is the prompt poem from Vicky here. When here we go. Ben Farquhart. A sudden yank rips my equilibrium. My moon rim shades whip fly. My body pitches to the pavement, straddled on the heavy frame, crimped like a dead bug pinched and bent, derailed and gaping, chained and linked, stuck half shredded in the sparkle clink. I claw at my baggy pushers, my bare ass not quite exposed. Thank God there are no onlookers to see my brand new khaki threads, the blackened reds, now a tell-told mark, the greasy, bone-deep farkle kark. A universal cycler's gripe. The passer asks, are you all right? So that was uh, Vicky Miko with uh, her poem. And then here's her definitions at the bottom here. Um, whip means to thrash wildly. Fly is to zoom across space and time. Sprockle is a cog wheel. A pinion, a pine seed. Clink, a sharp metal sound. Farkle, a motorcycler's bling. A dice game. Kark is something troubling, and tell told is a tally after the fact. And um, yeah, there's a little the Farkle Clark and things like that. A little uh, speaking of uh, um, the Jabberwocky, Lewis Carroll. Um, good examples of of some of those words there. The Sprockle Clink. And <laughs> good job um, with that, Vicky. Um, let's see who is next. We have Danny Mask. Let's call up Danny. Here comes Danny. Jim. Hey, Danny. Yeah, you're live on the air. How are you doing tonight? Hey, buddy. I'm doing great. A little tired, but I'm still alive. Well, that's good to hear. It's always great to hear from you. Um, uh, what do you have that you want to share tonight? Well, I sent you two. Um, I don't know if you have time for both, but um, the first one, um, I had a prompt from a from a poetry group for an earthquake, uh-huh. and I used to work for Toshiba, and we used to go to Irvine every quarter, and uh, there was an earthquake June twenty eighth, nineteen ninety one, and. Uh, There was a woman who died. She got hit in the head by a beam that came loose at that Santa Anita park. Oh, wow. And her name was was Julie Nicolay. And so this poem is for her. Okay, let me uh, uh, put it up. Yeah, here you go. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and, and read it. Everything invented yesterday trembles and falls on me crushed outside and inside. My blood feeds the evidence of gravity. This under-the-bed monster recently fed measures me with this order, my broken body found by flashlight. Thanks so much, Dan. That was Santa Anita Park Earthquake. Um, and that says, I am stable hand, Julie Nicoli. Thanks so much for sharing that, Danny. And uh, what was the other one that you wanted to share? That's the Unrequited Love uh-huh. poem. Okay. It's a little longer. I don't know whether you wanted to do that. Oh, oh we, have, we have time. It's so good. Uh, there's a there's a photo of it too. Um, what's the photo of? Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a photo of Joe. Uh-huh. So the, the story the story behind that is, um, she was one of my girlfriends in in college, mm-hmm. and um, and I and I told you that I had moved from Charlotte to Wilmington uh, this past year, and um, I was going through all my stuff to throw some stuff out because I've just had so much stuff, and then I found this photograph of her. And and so I thought, oh, my God, where did this come from? So I kept this picture and I wrote a poem about a few years ago. And then a couple of days ago, well, when you did the prompt uh, for Unrequited Love, I went through it and I revised it. Mm -hmm. Seriously, because this was like a real long poem. So this is this is like a I don't know. This is a rhyming poem that I never do. So this is this is and I like it, too, but it's a little rhymy. Yeah, go ahead. I haven't heard a rhyming poem from you, I don't think so. Go ahead whenever you're ready. No, I haven't done a rhyming poem. 
It's kind of old fashioned too. I, I kind of like it for the old fashioned. This is called Waterborne 1973. At the water's edge, you wade into the light, your sumptuous curves and divine hips glistening. You are a gorgeous sight. Elusive as water, your body still animates forever pure. You remain the evident presence of my secret longings, hopeful cure. Your dimples of Venus stir my restless self and the water's silvery plume. Each stride becomes a flush of desire, then a bursting flume. Your hands, cupped and faintly blue, do my eyes shimmer with tears? From the present does love beckon beauty, or is it beauty alone that endears? From afar, I hear your sweet voice, a reply to my invitation of hungry lust. So I foolishly jump inside this picture to reconnect us. In my ear, I whisper my wordless secret with my self-indulgent eyes. You turn and say, our love never existed. Then I softly cry. My musings crash into reality, arousing tearful waves, waterborne. This image engulfs my heart even after you're gone. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. It was Waterborne 1973, Danny Mills. Yeah. <laughs> thank, yeah. Thanks. thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Always a hey, pleasure. Great interview t- today. R- really good. Yeah, he's a, he's a good one. Um, and, and so are you. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Take care. Okay, it was Danny Mask. Um, let's call up uh, Nivedita next. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Ah, okay. So um, Nivedita can't join, but she sent two poems, so she she texted me really quick and um, asked if I could read them. So um, they're both small poems. Let's see what look, Nivedita had for us tonight. Um, the first one, um, this is the Portmandu, Portmandu poem. Um, this poem, okay. So here is Friday evening, and um, here's um, Nivedita's portmanteau. Friday evening. The pluffy cushion feels so hard today as the newscaster drones on about the smog and fog and Brexit and affluenza. Tired of the news, I turn back to my tofurkey dinner, wishing it were a cronut and a froyo. Boy, this pluffy cushion is not so pluffy anymore. It spoils my mood. With a good plump and fluff of the filling, I get back to some bad adver- bad advertising. That was supposed to be a Frab Julis Friday evening. Turned quite, um, that's, and that's it. That's my cue. My next blog post, a listicle on how not to spend a Friday evening. Hmm. I wonder what Charles D- Dogson would do on a Friday evening. That was Nivedita Karthik's, uh, um, portmanteau poem and um bad advertising i never seen that one before bad advertising interesting a bunch of good ones in here the listicle and whatnot thanks so much for sharing that nivedita and uh, the other poem uh from nivy is this right here let's see so this is um and as you know nivedita loves to do um funny and amusing stories from the news as poets respond and um this poem if i can get rid of the pop-ups This poem is Wisconsin Cow. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, Wisconsin Cow spotted going through McDonald's drive-thru. I wonder if we can have, if there's a picture. Here it is. Let's play it a little bit. Oh, never mind. We got too much ads. Anyway, a cow was spotted going through a (laughs) drive-thru, a McDonald's drive-thru. And I don't see any stills. Let's see. Yeah, I don't see any still pictures, so we will have to imagine the cow going through the drive-thru. Um, but here is Nivedita's poem about that. Some Moo Rhymes by Nivedita. Some Moo Rhymes. One, two, there's a queue at the drive-thru. Three, four, that's a view I can't ignore. Five, six, I wonder if that driver knows any tricks. Seven, eight, for he lugs such heavy freight. Nine, ten, of three calves, a duck, and a hen. Hey, diddle, diddle, there's a cow in the middle of that car at the drive through in McDonald's. This old Buick, it has a calf, and it's right in front of me, with a moo-moo one and a moo-moo two and a moo-moo three to boot. And that was that Nivedita's poem for the cow going through the McDonald's drive through Thanks for sharing that, Nivedita. Um, a pleasure, as always. 
Uh, let's call up, um, we'll do, well, next we'll do a first-time caller at the 718 after we do uh, Angela Gardner. So let's call up Angela, then we'll do the, the, the first-time caller we have, too. Hi, Tim. Hey, Angela, how are you doing hey, this Angela, evening? how are you doing this evening? Good, you can see me this time. <laughs> I can, it's great to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, um, so what did you have that you wanted to share? Um, I sent you, I don't know, I want it. Do the both poems? I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> well, it's up I to you. Have... I think I think we have time if you want to do them both. But if you want to just pick one, that's fine too. Totally your call. Okay. Well, let's do the the baby pass over the wall first. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I I said I kind of revised it a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, have, uh, I have the new version here. So. Okay. And and, yeah. and everybody's seen this photo, right? The the photo of the Marines passing the baby up over the over the barbed wire fence. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, I'm sure they did. I mean, it was, it was a video, but I just, and then he just handled it like luggage Mm -hmm. because I, there, we really don't know the gender of, of the baby, but it just, um, just that image, I think of him just, you know, grabbing the baby and just lifting it like so effortlessly, but not really Mm -hmm. where it it was just like, okay, we got to do this. You know, mm-hmm. and I, I don't think that's a reflection on the soldiers. I just think they were doing the best they can to get out, get every, get, get that baby out of there. But mm-hmm. I mean, and for the mother to pass that baby over the wall and to know that that he or she's going to safety, but still kind of in that unknown, I think that's um, it's just very it was a powerful image. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. Um, let's hear the poem. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. The baby passed over the wall. Grabbed by the back of a onesie, floating, a startled cry, the stranger in uniform, not a gentle str- snuggle, but a strong swing over the barbed wire. The baby will grow up to see a photo and the lift to be saved. A mother and father who knew they could no longer stay. The anchor at the American TV station might hail this as a failure of a government. It's a human moment, a family decision. Most of us will never experience. A mother understands that leaving all behind unselfishly should be the headline. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great poem, The Baby Passed Over the Wall. Um, do we know? Do we know any details about the baby at all? Like, like what happens when when a child is like unaccompanied, or, or did the parents manage to later? Or well, it was whole bunch it of... was reunited with the father later, mm-hmm. so well, that, like they good. did yeah. give an update. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, but that's kind of all that I know of the story. Um, but it was and it was reunited with with the father. So I I'm not sure. It didn't say about the mother, which I mm-hmm. thought was kind of strange. But you can I I would imagine that she was the one, you know, doing that. But um, but yeah, they didn't really say the gender, but they just said that, you know, the baby was fine. Yeah. You know, because it, it kind of looked rough when he did. that, But it's not, you know, it, again, it you know, it's he's trying to make sure that it's safely the baby safely over that barbed wire. I mean, that's a really high fence and mm-hmm. there was no other way to manage that, but it, it wasn't gentle, but it was just definitely like, okay, let's put this baby over there. Yeah. You what know? it reminded me of is watching like lions or something like just grab the, by the scruff and you know, but, I mean, I don't know. Um, anyway, th- yeah. Thanks for sharing the poem and highlighting that, that video um, and, and memorializing it that way. Um, and, and what was the other one that you wanted to share? Um, the other one, it's so funny because when Vicky said about like the language, there was a little language in this poem, but it was a night. It was it was like um, more like a peacock. But <laughs> like, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Um, like I, you know, if anybody, everybody knows that um, Charlie Watts um, mm-hmm. passed away from the Rolling Stones, um, the drummer. Um, and, you know, he was a big part. I mean. We actually have seen them several times. My that was my son's first concert. Um, oh, really? Was wow. the Rolling Stones? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> a good, good choice. <laughs> yeah, and um, I was in a band. I played bass guitar, and oh, wow. um, yeah, and we played um, the Stones. Like you know, we are not the Stones at all, but <laughs> <laughs> but we played um, 
obviously. But um, we did play a lot of the covers of the Stones, and um, and they were like a big part of you know. And I mean, I'm not in that generation, obviously, but you know, I feel that you know we connected with that um, era. So, um, and then you know, it's so when Charlie Watts passed away, um, we actually have um, a drummer um, who also passed away. Um, um, actually six years ago in August. And, you know, he was, you know, he was an amazing person and it was very sad. So it, when Charlie, you know, died, it kind of hit me. I, you know, I don't feel like I mourned him properly, hmm. our drummer. Like yeah. he was, you know, um, you know, he, he died young of, you know, cancer. And so, I mean, it just kind of brought up some things. So, um, and it's so it's pretty much, you know, this poem was kind of about Charlie, but it was also about kind of um, about Kevin, who is our drummer, who, you know, they had similar thing, similar person. You know, they had the drummer personality. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And he he was just like, you know, he didn't he just kind of did his thing. And while there was in our band, you know, the lead singer and the guitar player was, you know, the ones kind of driving the ship, like, you know, me and him as a bass player and the drummer was just kind of behind the scenes mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, kind of for the ride and doing and just playing our songs with them, you know, so it just, anyway. Yep. Okay. Well, go ahead. This is a rock band left without their beat. Okay. Um, in memoriam, Charlie Watts and Kevin. I watched his drumsticks. He held them like a jazzy, cool cat as the two biggest rock and roll cocks dance in front of his set. He had a far off look in a rhythm trance, sitting on the stadium steps, feeling sweaty in the heat, painted black, happy, and on and off herb scents. My husband and I were fans of the past generations and our band tried to cover the Rolling Stones like Get Off of My Cloud and Gimme Shelter. I couldn't sing like Aretha Franklin as my high-pitched voice seemed broken. On my jazz bass, I listened for the snare and stomp beat of our drummer. He was unpretentious and a teaser, who relaxed my nerves on stage with his calmness. He died of cancer six years ago this August. I remember his face when we played that last song. Like Charlie, he didn't want the glory. He was the man who kept the time with a passion of music and friends a oh, really touching poem thanks so much for sharing that angela um yeah just wonderful thanks so much thank you yep. have a good day yep you too it's angela gardner with a uh, rock band left without their beat and um the other poem is a baby the baby passed over the wall thanks angela um like i said we're gonna go to that um that uh, 718 number next we'll see who that was Hello. Hey, uh, who am I talking to? This is Tim, and you're live on the air. Okay. Oh, I think I hear myself in the background, so turn that off so that uh, the delay doesn't confuse you. Turn off my phone? Yeah, turn, no, turn off your uh, stream, whatever, wherever you're watching, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, whatever you're watching live. Turn that off or mute it at least. now? Yeah, that's okay? perfect. Yeah, yeah. So who am I talking to? Okay, this is Phil Stern. Ah, I'm so glad you could join us. Um, and what do you have that you'd like to share? Well, the prompt this week really spoke to me because I love wordplay. And in particular, I've been experimenting lately with, with uh, a long, very long poem that uh, uses a lot of wordplay, including a lot of portmanteau. Mm -hmm. So I'd like, it, it has six parts, and I, I wanted to read uh, two of them, if that's okay. Yeah, the first yeah, two. that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, you're going to put it up? Yep, it's up on screen, but you have to read your own copy, though, because you can't see this. Oh, okay, right. Because that delay okay. problem again, yeah. <clears throat> right. Okay, the first one, first of all, the long poem is called Witness, and uh, that is... Um, refers to two things. First of all, the general method of the poem wit, as well as what the speaker witnesses in the contemporary world. Hmm. 
And the first two parts, first one's called Witchcraft, and so it talks about the creation of these poems. And the second one is called Plagues, which presents some of the sad details of the contemporary life. There are four more parts, but that kind of answer a question at the end of Plagues. But at any rate, the first one is called Witchcraft. Okay, go ahead. I have and, up, whenever you're ready. Yeah, go. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, now I see it. <laughs> By the way, read your copy also... though, because uh, there's a there's twenty second delay, so it won't be at the same spot as the the, the uh, audio. Gotcha. Is. Yeah. Okay. Um, interestingly, Brendan talked about the place of chance and discovery and creation, and uh, <laughs> this poem uh, kind of touches on that too. Witchcraft. When I cast this spells upon the page. Gray magic sometimes happens. Double on tender fires new synopses in the brain, and misspelled weirds help me climb new speaks. Forced to exercise options, I'll stretch, pry open mental muscles till morsels of meaning glitter and restartle stone walled adjourned me. Sometimes small oracles happen. When spellbound, I chant, this curse is perverse. Okay, that's the first one. Um, the second one is called Plagues. Witnesses have testified how insider trading chews up small investors, corporate submergers drown mom and pops, Middle-aged menstruers, ripe young girls, and white privilegians makes black eyes shatter. Everywhere bad things are happening. Too many turn a blind eye am to climate denial, swarming icebergs, and whole whale extinction. And gas is growing to hurricanes. Some leaders still do not acknowledge the past six million holocaust, or the present failed the scope of frightened refugees, although it's still caught in the uncertain terror of their own dread livery. Everywhere there is angster, and too many seeking control find it easy to believe in miracles. Even good students learn to cheat with Wikipedia. Horned evil spreads all around, as herd those persons sow poison seeds on false book and stoke flak-wielding hatreds to breach the necessary walls of civil disobedience. Has that rough beast in the poet's miraculous vision descended at last? Is this the darkness drifting over refrigerated COVID wagons circling hospitals as breathless bodies stiffen and corona fires spiral. How do we live in a time of plagues? Very interesting poem. Um, and once again, that was Witness. And uh, I love a lot of wordplay, a lot of fun stuff in there, um, especially false book. Yeah, but... I'm going I'm to be using false book for now on. I don't know. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> that works really well. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to read it. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Hope you can call in again sometime. Okay, thanks. Yep, good night. Bye. Once again, that was uh, Philip Stern, and uh, that was the beginning of his longer poem, Witness, the first two sections of it. So um, keep an eye out for that somewhere. And um, yeah, how do we live in this plague-filled period? And uh, let's see. So we have, um, I think we're going to do, um, I have a poem here. Let's see. So Carlton Johnson says he has a poem. I'm trying to find it. Carlton texted me and asked if I could read it. Um, July 6th. Let me check my spam folder. Maybe it got up in there somehow. Nope. So Carlton, I still don't see. Let's see. Ah, I found it. Okay. Did we do this last week? Yep, 
Yeah, we did this last week. So I have the unrecorded poem. I'm not finding the other poem, Carlton. So email to me again. Send it to openmic at rattle.com. And if, if I get it before the show ends, I will definitely read it. Um, the other person who asked me to read one is um, Ted Guevara. And um, here this is, this is uh, he says, this poem is dedicated to Kurt Cobain and Robin Williams, who took their lives nearly 20 years apart. Uh, we are often starstruck. Each time we have this emptiness, we constantly try to fill. It's not really a commemoration. It's a stranger mood. We are part of the fall, the rise, of course, is when these talents were alive and producing unstoppable luster. And here's Ted, uh, Ted Bernal Guevara's Rise Fall. Rise Fall. Why do stars end their paths by dim or tire? They scrap impact particles. They create roads for us to drive through our auto, with our automatics. It's never easy, the ride. Asphalt and water mix, but not quick enough to hail solidity. Their weight depresses on bottomless chuck holes. We grieve till the morning light when their flares become ordinary blue. We can't see them anymore. We can only feel the cold so light in the air now. It vacuums our souls to meaningless. Why stars end their paths? Is it because they think they've lined ours with permanent silver? Whether it be of quick riff or, or sweet shouted ballad, how could that be when the sky hasn't rid of its dark ions? We juggle hindsight in and out of our minds like glass orbs. Still, there's no clarity to gaze through. Common eyes make plans to see the coming soon, but only while you're breathing. Why stars end their paths? We could only gather the scarcity, place it in a hope box also meant to disperse. And that is Ted Guevara's poem, Rise Fall. Thanks for sharing that, Ted. And um, now let's go to um, Patrice Wilson. And it's not too late to Skype Patrice. Let's call it Patrice Wilson. Is that the phone? Oh, yeah. Hi. Hey, Patrice. How are you doing tonight? What are you doing? How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so glad you could join us. I don't know if you want to push the camera button or not, but it's not on yet. So push it if you'd like to join by video, too. No, I don't think so today. I'm not feeling that well, and I'm kind of dressed accordingly or not accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. well, I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Uh, that's too bad. Thanks, though. Thanks for the thought. Um, so, uh, so what poem did you want to share? Just the, um, I think the, the poem about the uh, new middle age, mm -hmm. um, and because that interested me, and then I thought I was going to have some fun with it, and I made um, made it rhyme and everything, and then maybe um, the one about uh, the portmanteau poem. Okay, um, let me pull up the uh, news poem. Okay, on the new middle age, I have it right here. Um, so why don't you explain what that is about? Okay, uh, on, uh, on NBC there's a series called uh, New Middle Age, and that was reported on as a discovery on August 12th of uh, this year. And then they followed up they followed up every week since then with some article about how to uh, stop the brain from deteriorating uh, uh, as fast as it might. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they found that uh, having someone to listen to, a group of people to listen to and to be um, uh, someone to listen to and, and somebody to listen to you and talking and having that exchange will extend uh, memory and that kind of thing for at least four years. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, so I thought this was important. On the other hand, I also thought that this week's discovery was kind of already obvious, you know, that... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I made a little commentary on that as well. Okay, well, let's hear it. Whenever you're ready, I have it up. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, uh, hold on. Wait a minute. Just a second here. No, no problem. Okay. On the new middle age. There's a new middle age scientists found. 60s, the new 30. Till that age, we stay the same metabolically 
it doesn't go down till that later number, and this affects aging these days. So it's good to know when I'm 60, I'm 30, at, four, at 70, 40, but whoa, what's to happen to my retirement checks? Maybe this item's a hoax or a hex, except for the knowledge that we are able to keep our minds alert and stable by listening and being listened to, though this finding may be a bit overdue, because haven't we all already known the companions and friends with whom we can speak will keep anyone's mind, heart, and soul at their peak? That's a wonderful poem and great point, too. Um, a really fun and entertaining, but a good point at the end um, on the new middle age. Thanks for sharing that, Patrice. Yeah, you're welcome. And then the other one was the Portman Toe. Um, is there anything you want to say about that, or do you just want to read it? Mm. I just, uh, when I read the prompt, I thought of, oh, this this brings back a moment that I had uh, some years ago when I first saw the word uh, biopic. Mm. So let's read it. It's okay. just called Perfect Telephone. My suitcase failed to open into two equal halves. That first minute I tried to read the word B-I-O-P-I-C. I quickly believed it was pronounced biopic. Some new type of lens for older folks' glasses, or maybe a syndrome involving two factors, or perhaps describe creatures who live double lives. But later I find the two halves of this word actually referred to a movie picture biographical, so I was go figure and found myself laughable. I hope I don't sound like too much of a clown, for I've told the truth as poetic as poems of old. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was Portmanteau Poem um, by Patrice yes. Wilson. Thanks, Patrice. You're welcome. You're yeah, welcome. Have, yep, good night. Good night. That's uh, Patrice Wilson once again with uh, two poems, Portmanteau Poem and um, On the New Middle Age. And um, let's see. That might be everybody. Do you... And let's, let's see if um, I got that poem from Carlton Johnson. Here it comes. So maybe it was just delayed on the on the server. This is Char- Carlton Johnson's Portmanteau poem. Any portmanteau in a storm. So he went with the same pun as I did. Let's see. Any portmanteau in a storm. This is Carlton Johnson. Today I rose from my sleep-laden bed. Perhaps I will call it a sled. Skipping breakfast, I prepare for a smog-free Sunday brunch. My fridge door opens like a tomb, creaking. My eyes scan the shells, my tummy crying on empty. It is full of hangry, but what to eat? I located two boxes of rice aroni, better than early childhood craft macaroni, and cheese and some bisquick for dumplings. And two, some silk for my coffee, soy, and milk. But settled instead for an apple teeny or two. It was Sunday, after all, and I'm fitter was just around the corner. Uh, and that was uh, Any Portmanteau in a Storm by Carlton Johnson. Thanks so much, Carlton, for sharing that. And um, let's see. Okay, so... Here's a poem, um, and T.R. Paulson's not here, but she sent this poem. This was submitted to Poets Respond. And, um, oh, this reminds me that there's somebody who has... I wanted to have on as a quick guest, um, and, and we'll have to do that later. But this is from Jade Journal, and it was a poem that T.R. Paulson submitted to Poetry Respond. We didn't publish it, but somebody else did it at this Jade Journal, jadejournal.org. You see it on the screen right here. And um, um, New Writing on Justice is the subtitle. And this is T.R. Paulson's poem, The Devil's Triangle. Um, Three glasses in a triangle um, is a phrase by Brett Kavanaugh. And there's not an explanation for for what um, the poem is about, but but given the quote by Brett Kavanaugh, I think we're going to be able to figure it out. So let's hear it. This is once again T.R. Paulson with The Devil's Triangle. Not that. I see a three-sided room. One wall gleams of brimstone, globs of gold and yellow, dripping molten beads that slide and run all over. Sixty degrees, the angle to its fellow formed by flames hot as passion or a welder's torch, or sixty times as hot. The darkest room, all in Gehenna, 
this ungodly triune's elder guards the gate into this grisly feast of gloom. A line of spinning pitchforks from the stinging sulfur fumes to the wordless tongues that hiss spit up sparks. A place for torture slinging, villains only. A man who forsakes with a kiss, a child slicing ruler, a naked father, a bad guy with a gun. Or do I look and see it's all a lie? That is the Devil's Triangle um, by T.R. Paulson from recently published in J. Journal. And um, and that was obviously a poetry spun poem from the time I think of the Kavanaugh confirmation trials, I would have to assume, um, given the epigram being a quote from Brett Kavanaugh, probably from that, um, those confirmation hearings. I think I said trials, confirmation hearings. Um, okay, so I believe that is all we have for today. Let me double check. I just don't want to miss anybody. Okay, I think we're good. And um, now... Okay, so here is our Saiku then. And um, the Saiku for this week comes with a picture too, um, just to show you what this is talking about. This is an article from um, the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, here is a photograph. Where'd it go? Here's a photograph to show you um, the. Um, hang on one second. Okay, there we go. So this is the the great unformity, which is something I didn't know anything about. But apparently, in um, you know, the Grand Canyon is like a timeline looking down through Earth's history because each layer is a different era of bedrock. And it goes back some 2 billion plus years, um, except for this one gap where from about 700 million years ago, um, it jumps straight to um, about 1.6 um, million, no, billion years ago. Um, so, so you can see in this, uh, in this photograph here that the strata, the big shift in strata here, one is um, basement rock, it's called, and the other is the uh, Tanto group of stones that are, that are more sed sedimentary. And um, so the strange thing is that this, it's a timeline with this big gap missing. And how did this gap appear? Or, did, you know, how, where did the rock go? You know, it's, it's millions of years of rock, almost a billion years, really, of rock. Um, and it's just gone from, um, from the, the ground. And um, so there's a lot of theories about what happened to it. But researchers at the University of Colorado this week published a study looking at uh, using um, chemical compounds to determine the temperature the rocks were uh, at different times, um, leaving these traces of chemicals that they, that they leave behind. So they made a whole temperature profile. And they realized that rock at this layer, um, this lower layer, uh, was, was above ground at the time, um, about 700 million years ago, on the west end of the Grand Canyon. But on the eastern end, it was miles or multiple miles below the surface. Um, and so the theory now is that when the supercontinent, the first Pangaea, broke up, the whole continent of North America shifted, and all these rocks, as they were eroded, fell off into the sea. And so it's the breaking up of Pangaea, the first Pangaea, that um, caused this missing great, un great unconformity, which has been a, a geological puzzle for the last 150 years. So here's my psyche about that for this week. Basement rock exposed at the surface, the great divorce. Basement rock exposed at the surface, the great divorce. And that is your psyche for this week. And uh, next week's prompt is going to be um, write a poem set in a time period of at least 100 years ago. So you could write a poem about um, the geologist who discovered that in the Grand Canyon on a rafting trip when he uh, was headed down there, 100 and, I think it was 1869. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's the one who discovered this missing layer in the rock because you can just see it from the river, apparently. Um, so that would work, but anything 100 or more years ago has to be the setting for the poem. That is your prompt for next week, so find anything back in time. And uh, that's next week's prompt. And next week's guest is going to be um, Gil Arzola. Um, that's going to be Sunday, September 5th, uh, the usual time. Gil, if you haven't gotten, if you're a subscriber and haven't gotten your um, uh, fall issue yet, which is arriving like right around now, it might be Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday for people in the U.S., a couple weeks later for people um, overseas possibly. 
But um, Gil Arzola is the the first of our three winners for the this year's Rattle Chapbook Prize, and his book is The Death of a Migrant Worker. Just wonderful personal story about um, life and death and his parents. Um, really, really poignantly and directly written. And um, just a wonderful chapbook if you haven't read it yet. If you, have, if you haven't read it yet, you have about a week to read it so you can sort of get a feel for it. Or you can be introduced to it next week as we read and discuss it with uh, Gil Arzola and Rattlecast 109. That is the usual time, Sunday, September 5th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. I mean, I should say 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That's Sunday, September 5th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, hope to see you then. We'll do your prompt poems, too, uh, to write a poem set in a period of at least 100 years ago. That'll all be Rattlecast number 109. Have a great night, and I'll talk to you soon. Good night.